Welcome to Arise Life, a community of believers being equipped, empowered, and released into their destiny. For more information, go to arisealife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. If you've been with us, you guys know we've been going through the book of Corinthians, and the Corinthians is a book, uh, it's actually originally a letter written by Paul to a church he planted in the city called Corinth. If we can pull up that first map. Um, so Corinth is just down from Athens in Greece, but it's on this narrow spit of land that's only about four miles wide, and some really genius entrepreneurs in about 6th century BC figured out, hey, instead of going all the way around the Achaean Peninsula, where Sparta is, which is super dangerous and really long, we can just have pe- pe- people can pay us to drag their boats over, and it's just four miles versus like 300 miles. And they started to make money hand over fist. Incredibly wealthy town, uh, a, a town of uh, lots of sailors. And as a result, this town is, um, can we pull up the next one? Yeah, so it's a really this little area. The, uh, is, there was three little uh, cities together all in one, the city of Corinth. And it was a city that involved, uh, um, like most sailing towns, it had sailors, merchants, and prostitutes. And it had good Jews uh, judging everyone. And it, was a, and it was out of this that God made an incredible body as Paul preached the gospel. And people saw that their bankruptcy in their lives, they, they, they said it's not working. They came, they received the gospel, they received Christ's life instead of their own. And they were completely set free and they began life in a community and it was amazing. And there were no more problems. Anybody here, like you were dreaming of the next phase of life and then problems cease? Maybe it's a boyfriend, maybe it's a girlfriend, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's having kids, maybe it's a job, and that's when the problems really got real? Blink twice. Okay, okay. You know what I'm talking about? Like you're like, oh, man. And in fact, any, when, when you live by yourself, I've said this many times, when you live by yourself, uh, as this guy, a single guy, I lived for maybe four or five years by myself, you don't realize a lot of things about yourself. Any guys, what do, you, what do you think? What are some things that a guy living on his own might not notice about himself? Selfishness. I thought that was my spiritual gift. What else? Sloppy. Wow, you guys, okay, I guess we're protecting the fathers today. All right, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go for hygiene, right? Cleanliness, picking up after yourself, hi, uh, selfishness, actually caring about somebody else other than yourself, right? And, uh, you know, again, I say when, before we, uh, we um, you know, we dated or before we got married, I, I thought I was pretty amazing. I thought I was God's gift. And it's not because Masha pointed anything out in me. Her presence reveals some things. Like anybody done this, you're like going through your day and then you see a really beautiful person of the opposite sex and you're like, <laughs> you want to smell your breath. You want to make, oh, everything all right? Everything okay? Right? When we come into the presence of other people, we become aware of things in us that are not okay. Now, are they the problem? No. I always had the problem in me. I just didn't realize it. And so a lot of times in community, that's when the problems show up. Can you imagine there being any problem by bringing together hyper-religious, judgmental Jews with prostitutes? None? You don't see any issues? Occasional stoning. <laughs> After the offering, we'll begin our stonings. Right? You know, like, it's like, do you think that they might have come in with a slightly different moral compass? Yeah? And, you know, is God is after killing self-righteousness as much as he is sexual immorality. Just saying that. So anyway, so it's into this body that he's speaking. But uh, in the middle of this body, there came up an issue. And we talked about this last week. The issue was kind of a minor one. Actually, a major one. A guy was sleeping with his mother-in-law. And they were coming to church. Yeah, mother-in-law. Stepmother. Well, stepmother. Oh, stepmother. That would be bad. Mother-in-law. Whew, that got even worse. I'm from Kentucky, so things are optional. The mother-in-law was his stepmother. Whoa! <laughs> no. Uh, with his stepmother. 
So I don't know. I don't know which is worse, honestly. But anyway, uh, and needless to say, not only was they were sitting on the front row, apparently, and they were like all proud of themselves. And um, have you ever had a friend who's doing something that's really detrimental to themselves and to other people and couldn't see it? And you didn't know how to let them know. And so it kept getting worse and worse and worse. This was that. And so he's like, okay, guys, some of you are actually celebrating that this is a sign of your freedom that you guys uh, in Christ. And let me tell you, we talked about this last week. We are not set free to sin. We're set free from sin. We're set free from the need to do things to meet God-given needs in ways God never intended. And so, you know, he, he pushes for this, and he's, and he's been saying for, through, he starts out in chapter 4, and he says, you guys, you can't judge until it's revealed. And we talked about this, that, that the church is very good at judging the world, isn't it? It's like a superpower. We have blogs dedicated to it, judging the world left, right, and center. And Paul says, do not judge the world. They're the world. But you need to judge yourselves, the church. But for the things that are revealed, not for the things you think other people are doing. And we're going to get to this in a minute. A minute, we'll talk about this. It's for the things that are really causing harm, not for the things that just annoy you. Just saying. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, so, and so this is what he says. He says, what, uh, verse uh, uh, 12 of chapter 5, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Will God judge those out, God will judge those outside, but rather expel the person, the wicked person from among you. And we talked about how that is just terrifying. Uh, I'm saying this because there are a bunch of you all who weren't here last week, and I don't want you to lose your minds. Um, but what we're talking about is that's on the back side of first actually talking to the person vulnerably face to face about what's going on in their lives. Okay. Any, anybody have a friend who's in addiction? Okay. Everybody really. You just don't know it or you're blind or you have the same addiction. So it's not really an addiction. <laughs> it's a, a support group of another kind, right? Um, so, and... And the first thing is you're like, hey, man, I see that that thing is killing you. I see that that's messing you up. I see that you're choosing that over relationship. I see you're choosing that over going to work. I see you're choosing that over a bunch of things. And I know who you are. And I know that you're amazing. I know that you, you could be incredible. But this thing's killing you. That's love. That actually, believe it or not, is judgment. You know what judgment is? Simply providing a mirror to people to let them see what's happening to them. But say they brush it off. Anybody done that? Anybody done that? Anybody reached out to a friend and they're like, yeah, whatever, man. Stay in your own lane. Deal with yourself. But anybody known that somebody in addiction, what's happening in their lane tends to get outside their lane, right? And out as it comes out of your lane, then... He's God, you know, Jesus says, take two or three people and go say, hey, okay, first of all, you gaslighted the first guy. <laughs> You're not going to gaslight all three of us. All three of us, we're looking you in the eye. Listen, you are on a highway to hell. It is not going to turn out well. I, do you see? Do you see? But anybody done that? And it didn't turn out well? Now, I want to say this. We have to do this in love. We are fighting for people, not against them. Anybody wanted somebody to stop sinning because, it, because you felt unsafe and you just wanted to shoot them? That's not this. That is not this. That's something the church thrives at. The church is really good about, stop doing that. I don't like that. That's not this. It's fighting for relationship. And then the final thing is, if they won't recognize the three of you trying to love them, and, they're, and, it's, and it's visible, it's visible. Anybody notice that about sin? That it doesn't stay vis invisible? It has a tendency to creep out, 
you know? It's like, it's like anybody have a friend, you, you went to their house for the first time and you could tell what kind of pets they had? <laughs> and he apparently pees a lot right? The same thing is it tends to creep out and as it creeps out, then it's, then it's like, listen, you are not fooling anybody. Please, for your sake, for ours, please choose relation. I don't want you. I don't need you. I don't need anybody, right? And at that point, when he says expel, he's simply saying, guys, don't put up with it. It's detrimental. It's killing you all. And that's what he means by expel the wicked person or in another case, turn him over to Satan. Because we talked about this last week with somebody in addiction. The most terrifying moment is when you say, I love you, but I can't do this anymore. You have consistently chose your addiction over our relationship. And I have to let you go and have what you're choosing so that you may discover, hopefully, without it killing you, that it is killing you and you're losing everything. That's the harshest, the most difficult kind of love there is, isn't there? So this is what he's been talking about. He's talking about in this, in this context, he's talking about fighting for relationship. But do you know there's other ways we destroy relationship? And believe it or not, one of them is judgment. <laughs> God, I've been, I'm here to judge people. Do you know a judgment that is love that provides a mirror is a little bit different than the self-righteous judgment? Okay, okay. let me ask you a question. Let's just try this. Let's do this. We're going to do judgment, and we're going to do, uh, uh, gonna do uh, loving judgment, like we just described, and we're going to do self-righteous, self-protective uh, judgment. And let's just talk about that for just a second. In the theory, it's theoretical. Don't talk about anybody in particular. Just nudge them while you're doing it. All right, so when somebody is self-righteously or self-protecting, judging someone, what does it look like? You're going to hell, right? I just, you know, and I'll push you. What, what are some examples? What, like, help me out. You don't, huh? Oh, come on, people. All right, let's come over to the loving side. I just described it. So you can cheat. Let's come on. Give me, what are some attributes? If I'm lovingly uh, judging, I'm confronting someone, what does that look like? How's that working for you? How's that working for you? So it's a question. It's not accusatory. It's a question. I would say it's vulnerable. Right? You are... It, when you do that, it hurts me. It's vulnerable. What are some other attributes you think? What else would it be like? Loving is a lot more careful. Lot more careful. Yes. Okay, who are my flamethrower people? <laughs> like, if it comes down to a confrontation, people are going to die. Like, I'm not confrontational. So if you push me that far, prepare to die. Right? No? <laughs> All the non-confrontational people. <laughs> right? No, it, it's careful. That's a great one. It's, it's, it's looking, it's, I want to say it's for the other person. It's fighting for. I want to say with vulnerable, it's risky. Because you can't guarantee the outcome, can you? Because there's another free will individual on the other side, isn't there? You can't guarantee what they're going to do. Okay, who here, when you're going to confront someone, you have an entire like flow chart in your mind written out with like thought bubbles. You know, like if they say this, then I say this, and then I, and, I, and it's like you're trying to box them in, right? Guarantee outcomes. How well does that? Uh, it doesn't, it's risky. You cannot eliminate the risk because they can still, they get to make choices. It's not about manipulation. It's actually about freedom. Okay, so using this as our cheater, what do you think might be on this side? Sh 
Shame. Shame. All right. What up? Anger, passive, aggressive. Oh, I'm loving this. Now you're talking. You guys have gotten warmed up. All right. Say that again. Compares. Ooh, yes. Why aren't you like your brother? Because he's my brother. Have you seen him? All right. Aggressive. What else? Condemnation. Did I hear Karen's? We apologize to all those, like my mother, who are named Karen, but yes, we understand. <laughs> I'll put that in quotes. Accusatory. What's that? Accusatory. Accusatory, yes. Um, character assassination. Ooh, oh, that's good. You did this once, you are always, right? Ooh, yeah, that we, I, that's like doing, you know how they do forest fires? They try to prevent them by doing a back burn. Yeah, gossip is like a back burn. You try to like burn all the way around it to contain the mess. I love it. Great. Not really. I mean, whether, anyway. Manipulation. Manipulation. Oh, come on. It's like you guys know something about this. Ooh, yes, gain or protect. Yeah. And I would put with that control. Ooh, rescuing, rescuing. Yes, yes, ooh. Oh, yeah, that goes, I think, with rescuing. Yeah, like... Yeah, because your problem bothers me, and I don't actually want to confront you. I'm just going to clean up your mess. Hopelessness. Okay, try to dig it down. Yeah, right. <laughs> Scott was like, I, I was, he was just talking about himself right now. <laughs> he was like, I just feel hopeless. All right, okay. All right, good. Now that you're depressed. All right, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Come on. Well, and that's the reality. Yeah, you can have questions on both sides and you can have statements, but the statements on this side are about me. It hurts my heart when you. We do act like a freaking idiot, blah, blah, blah. right? Yeah, come on, that's good. So, so this is this is where we come in. So then, this is where he's addressing chapter verse one of chapter six. Good grief! Here we go. If any of you has a dispute with one another, shoot at them. Oh, sorry, that was that side. All right. Uh, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's God, before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you were to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have thi- if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those? whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, each brother takes the another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Wow. So what's happened in this case is there was a problem, and instead of actually addressing it, they just sued the other person. Okay, I have a question. How many people have ever had somebody else assume something about you that wasn't true? Okay, good. How enjoyable was that? Anybody had it where they actually started to believe and feed that plant so much it grew into a mighty tree? And in fact... They then use that tree to beat you with it and to run away from you. Anybody been ghosted over something that was assumed? Wouldn't you have wished that at the very first they did some brave, loving confrontation? I 
feel like that you did, you, when you didn't call me the other day, when you said you would, I felt like I didn't matter to you. Is that true? Does that sound vulnerable? Or I'll just ghost you. Obviously, I don't matter to you. Um, yeah, so I was in a car wreck. And I got, I was be, when I was supposed to be calling you, I was being, uh, you know, airlifted out to a hospital. Oh. What happens is instead of dealing with things when they're small, they're allowed to grow. And they've gotten to the point where they're suing each other rather than dealing with issues. Verse 9, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be deceived? Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. What does he mean there? Do you know what that word inherit? You know when inheritance happens in the Jewish world? It happens when you become an adult, not when your dad dies. Inherit the kingdom of God means you don't get to experience the kingdom of God today. You don't get to experience today. Anybody here, when you lied, oh, okay. Anybody here, you gossiped about somebody, and then when you were around them, you felt really uncomfortable? What did you do with that person? You pushed away, didn't you? You pushed yourself away. When we engage in what God never intended us to do, and it's, I love it that he includes slander, a.k.a. gossip, in that list. You know, because people are like, oh my gosh, look at that, look at that. He's like, no, you engage in any of these, what happens is you're distancing your heart. You're, di you're not able to experience the kingdom that God desired for you. And these are the things that we fight for in each other when they come up. He said, and this is, that is what some of you are, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You have been made clean. You have been made whole. So why are you doing these things? Okay. Do you guys remember at the very beginning, Exodus chapter 20, God wanted a relationship with everybody, right? He said, he, the Israelites, he had them all there at the base of the mountain. He said, he said, here's the deal. I've only got a few rules for you. How many rules did God have? Ten. I mean, I love it. He even used all of our fingers. It's like super easy, super easy track with. So what are those 10? What are those 10? Can we pull those up? It's the very end, very end, sorry. There we go. So the first one is, if we're going to have this relationship, there can be nobody else in it. In marriage, there can only be one other person in it, right? Right? This is a, I don't want any other gods in this. And I want it to be about me, not about uh, idols, not some external thing, because you know how they build a golden calf for themselves. And I don't want you to use me. Using the Lord's name in vain was literally using it as a magical totem. Don't use me. Who here wants to be used? Good. All right. So, and the fourth is keep the Sabbath day holy. That means rest so God can work. Let me work in your life. So these first four are all about relationship with God. Now, what's the next six? Honor your father and mother. And it says, this is the first uh, commandment with a promise that it may go well with you all your days. Who's judged your parents? Yeah. What does it do inside your heart? We think it's protecting ourselves, but it actually is sowing seeds that the things we rejected in them actually begin to manifest in us. You shall not murder. Is that a good idea? Can we agree on that? Is this complicated? Wow. <laughs> they agree. Uh, you shall not commit adultery. Right? You shall only have sex with your spouse. You shall. Why? Why is that? L let me just say briefly why, why God talks about sex so much. If anybody's used sex a lot, you actually already know. Because sex is a deep, deep heart connection. You can act like it's not, but it's a heart connection. And when you have a heart connection and then it gets ripped apart, what happens to your heart? 
There's a reason why you have seat belts in your car because it goes fast. A covenant of marriage is a seat belt for deep, close heart connection. So you don't actually just go around having deep heart connection with people and ripping it apart. You shall not steal. Why? Because it violates relationship. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Slander, baby. Lying about people, gossiping. You shall not covet. Why? Because jealousy causes me to make you my enemy. See, all of these are about protecting relationship. And God felt that 10 was enough. But what did the people say? No, 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 no. When God said, come on, let's have a relationship. They said, we'll have a relationship through uh, Moses. Just give us a list of rules. And so they ended up with the law with 212 rules. And they couldn't keep those, so they came up with another 400 to kind of make it a little, e so they didn't accidentally me mess up. All of these are about protecting relationship, and, and he felt that this was enough. What if we just kept these? What if, and these, notice that sexual immorality is there on number seven. What he's saying, he said, we're not, it's not about making minor issues major. It's about loving one another. When you're doing things that are going to violate relationship, things that are going to have horrible consequences in your life, that I want, anybody want somebody to fight for you when you're dumb? Yes. Every single one of us has the ability to be dumb. And in those moments, I need you to fight for me. I need you to be able to say, when it's small, hey, bro, whoo, easy, easy, tiger. That's why he's saying this is such a big deal because even though we have been set free from the power of sin, sin can still have consequences. True? Anybody found that to be true? And the grace of God is the power of God to both walk free of sin, but also be delivered from, so that you can actually, with his power, clean up the mess of the sins you've committed. Anybody here made some pretty big messes? Who are my runners? Hey, I've run, I've moved states, so I'm pretty professional. No, run, listen, God wants to empower you to clean up mess, but you can't clean up mess if you won't admit there is a mess. And that's where having friends who will fight for you and not condemn you and will not just sit there and go, oh, yeah, that's the best you can do. Gird yourselves. <laughs> um, I had a conversation a couple of years ago with this one girl and... She was, she, was she was asking me and, and kind of telling me, she was like, well, it's really insensitive to say, um, I don't know, that, it's, that it's, it's not okay for men to sleep with men or for women with women, okay? So, so the whole sexual confusion issue, okay? It's very politically incorrect, right? Like, I'm sure I'm stepping on toes right now, but I, I, I don't care. No, 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 I, I no. I do care. You, I do no, care because enough. you do. I do because you I love. I care enough because you that love. I will bring it up. Okay. So I said, yes, it's insensitive if there is no answer. It's insensitive to say if there is no solution, right? Um, but in that situation, we were just prayed for someone and someone's leg grew out. And I said, because her leg grew out, I can say that, sexual confusion can be broken off. Because the power of Jesus is enough for every kind of brokenness. Every kind. Every kind of brokenness, right? So we, we're not shocked at sin. We're not mad at people who sin. Mm -hmm. But we know that there is freedom. And I want us to be a body that doesn't just say, well, it's the best they can do, right? They're just, it's their brokenness. It's whatever. It's no, I want us to be a place where we like, wow, no, there is more. Like, I love you where you are, and I will not condemn you. I will not judge you. But I know that there is more. I know that there is freedom. I know that you can step into it because of what Jesus did on the cross. Not because you can clean up yourself and hold yourself together and just, you know, just 
white knuckle it for the rest of your life. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, he has given us a different nature. There's an invitation to step into more freedom. Um, I said that last time. I, I, I would love for us to be a place where we're not figuring out what I can get away with sin-wise. But where I, I am trying to figure out what I can get away with righteousness-wise. Like how far I can go, right? I feel like he didn't just bring us to zero. He brought us like two plus hundred thousand, right? And we keep growing in this. So I want our mindset to shift from just like, well, it's broken little old me and I'm just in my mess for the rest of my life to like, no, he has brought me out of this. He has, he has set me free for righteousness. He has set me free to raise the dead. He has set me free for a purpose. There is a purpose, right? But if I sit and, it, and I'm just like with this, well, you can have it. But why would you want it? Yeah. Right? Come on. If like a prodigal <laughs> son, yes, you can sit with the pig's things and wallow in it, but like here is your father with a ring and the robe. Right? Like the choice is not that difficult. Come on. Come on. And I just want to cast a vision for us like no, we're not going to like stone you or whatever, right? Like but that the, there is more, right? There is like in every situation, in every relationship, like there is more for me. Like I am every day discovering more and more freedom and I want to step in more and more freedom and grow, right? It says even Jesus, he was completely without sin, but he grew in favor with God and man. Like I just love looking around the room and like seeing how each one is growing. Like we do not expect perfection. Family, like, I love that line that religion expects perfection, but family celebrates progress. Like, I, I meet with people all the time, and they're like, well, I've messed up here, and I messed up there, and I'm not here. I'm like, oh, my goodness. But look how far you've come. Like, a year ago, you were here, and you are over here. Like, let's celebrate that. You are getting freedom. You're getting breakthrough. Let's celebrate it. Let's not be like in the mindset, well, that there, this is all there is for me and I'll always be here. No, you are growing. Like each one of us is growing so fast. But I want us to be this place where there is hope that things can be different. That there is, there is this confidence that sin can be just broken off. That the demons can leave. That torment goes. That we can be set free and walk in freedom and destiny. Come on. Whew. Right? This is the vision. It's not like, well, how tolerant can we be that everyone feels comfortable? <laughs> right? Even though they're dying. Yeah. I don't want to be a comfortable place for those who are dying. Come on. Like, if you're dying, like, I want to, like, do a, whatever this thing is with the, with the pedals. Yeah, the electric. To your heart. Yep. Electric shock. <laughs> right? Like, I don't want you just to lay here and bleed out. Like, I'm going to come and get in your face, right? And like, be okay, let's talk about this. <laughs> this is not okay for you to bleed out. This is not okay for whatever. So I, I, I'm, I'll bring it back um, to sexuality because that's fun. And, um, but um, <laughs> let me give you an example. You, we, all of us have a God-given needs for pleasure, and we have God-given needs for intimacy to be known to be seen, and for physical touch. We need these. Without those, we actually die. Literally, they've done horrible studies by the Nazis. It's, it's true. Without physical touch, without intimacy, you die. Because we were made to be in relationship, we were made to be seen and made to know. So imagine, uh, you know, we lived in Russia, and if you had a house that didn't have heating, you would die in the winter. Minus 40, you'd die, right? I mean, that's a fact. So you have a need for heat. So imagine someone's dying in a house and you hand them a pair of a box of matches. What are they going to do? They're going to burn something. And they might start with the wood, but when the wood runs out, they're going to start burning the bed. And they're going to start burning the chair. And they're just going to start burning everything, right? Finally, just burn the house down. What if... Instead, I tell you, <clears throat> yeah, nice match. That's for the candles. That's just for mood lighting. 
uh, actually there's a heater in the corner. If you just turn it on, it's connected to the power grid and it will heat this house. See, when I see someone in sin meeting a God-given need in a way that God didn't design, it might have short-term ability to meet that need, but long-term brokenness and consequence. But if there's no power, for me to point that metal box over in the corner is, is not helpful. It doesn't burn! That thing is not flammable. It is not helpful. If there is no God, if there is no God who provides power true power, supernatural power to live a life that he designed is to fill us because part of the intimacy we desire is to be known by our creator who sees us as we are, warts and all, sin and all, and loves us passionately. That's part of the intimacy. Part of the intimacy of being known by your friends who see you as you are and still love you and fight for you. That's the intimacy. If there's physical touch, there's all these kind of things. But when I try to meet it, in a way that God didn't intend, the end result is, over time, pleasure decreases. Whatever, what felt like intimacy goes away, and you end up with married with children. The show. You end up hating the person you once loved. Because sex cannot make you Intimate. And that's why when God has given us a God-given need, we fight for one another and say, listen, I know who you are. I know who you're made to be. I know that you are made for love. I know you're made for intimacy. I know you're made for life. And I am going to fight for you because there's more for you. There's more for you. Not because God's holding out on you, but because God has even more for you. Wow, that was intense. Totally intense, totally intense. But if we're going to have people who know us, they're going to know our junk too. If we're going to be intimate, we're going to have people, and we need people who are safe enough to call us on it, not, not point the finger, but say, hey, bro, you're hurting yourself. Hey, bro. Whew. Wow. So right now. If you, everybody just, uh, Jesus, <laughs> deliver us, set us free. So what I, what I really feel like right now is, is that, you know, Jesus said, you're trying to point out the speck in your friend's eye while you have a log in yours. If you really love someone and you want to fight for them, it has to start with us. It has to start with us. It's a little hard to be self-righteous and judgmental when we realize what God is working on us. So, Father, I ask right now, Lord, if we have a hunger for the more, Lord, I ask that you would show us what's blocking the more in our lives. What are the needs you gave us that we're trying to meet in ways you never designed? Lord, Jesus, if we are self-protecting, and therefore keeping ourselves from being known. If we're slandering, if we're judging, if we're using sexuality in a way it was never intended, cutting ourselves off from intimacy, Lord, I ask right now that you would come and speak to us. Give us courage to believe that there is freedom. Freedom. <sighs> Porn is not, it's not more powerful than God. Jesus, I ask right now that you would breathe hope over your people. Lord, that you would breathe courage over us to fight for one another, to fight, to fight that they might know that we're for them, not against them. Lord, that you would continue to bring forth testimonies in our body of the supernatural deliverance that is an everyday occurrence in this body. Lord, we love you. If we can have the worship team come up, I want you to know that whatever you're dealing with, there is somebody in this body that has a breakthrough in that area. I'm just telling you, whether it's same sex, whether it's uh, porn, whether it's alcohol, whether it's slander, whether it's gossip, whether it's ju being judgmental of others, 
there is freedom available. There's someone here who has a testimony. And I would just encourage you to ask God to give you grace to figure out who. <laughs> and ask them to pray for you. Whew. Jesus. We're going to go into worship, and I'm believing God is going to give us a special measure of His grace today. For more information, go to AriseLife.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.